the leper scholar. Rabbi Slomo Yishkaki, generally known today by the anchor name Rashi, which is Rabbi Shlomo Ishkaki, or A-S-H-I, was a medieval French rabbi and author of a comprehensive commentary on the Talmud and commentary on the Tanakh. He is known as the first rabbi to believe that the Jewish people as one man, Israel, are God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The early sages expected a personal Messiah to fulfill the Isaiah prophecy. No alternative interpretation was applied to this passage until the Middle Ages, which began in 400 Common Era. Rashi held the position that the servant passages of Isaiah referred to the collective fate of the nation of Israel the Jewish people, rather than a personal Messiah. Some, righteous, uh, <clears throat> some rabbis, such as Ibn Ezra and Kimshi, agreed. However, many other rabbinic sages during this same period of time and later, including Moses ben Maimon, commonly known as Maimonides, and also referred to by the acronym Rambam, a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, realized the inconsistencies of Rashi's views and would not abandon the original Messianic interpretation. Rashi's commentary on Isaiah 52 verses 13 through 15 and 53, supporting his position conflicts with his commentary on the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, when he says, quote, and this is his, uh, a preamble to chapter 1. This is a commentary on a particular verse. The prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. Nonetheless, I will put my heart to reconciling the verses one by one according to the interpretations that resemble it in following the interpretation of Jonathan. The teacher of righteousness Rashi awaits is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. That's how he's referred to. The teacher of righteousness, the suffering servant, and on and on. It's good. There's a lot of different names, but there's no question the teacher of righteousness is God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous by his knowledge. He is referring to a particular man, and not the people of Israel, which would include himself. Rashi is known for his inconsistencies in his, in his interpretations I have read. I don't know that to be true. I haven't studied Rashi. Some of the first written interpretations are targums, which are ancient paraphrases on biblical texts, See Isaiah 53 is referring to an individual servant, the Messiah, who would suffer. Messianic Jewish Talmudist Hrachmiel Fidland recounts these early views. Our ancient commentators with one accord noted that the context clearly speaks of God's anointed one. That would be from Isaiah chapter 11, the descendant of King David, the Messiah. The Aramaic translation of this chapter, ascribed to Rabbi Jonathan ben Aziel, a disciple of Hillel, who lived early in the second century, common era, begins with the simple and worthy words, 
Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. He shall be high and increase and be exceedingly strong. As the house of Israel looked to him through many days, because their confidence was darkened among the peoples, and their complexion beyond the sons of men. Targum Jonathan on Isaiah 53, ad locum. That's in parentheses, and that ends the quotes. We find the same interpretation in the Babylonian Talmud. What is his, the Messiah's, name? The rabbis said, his name is the Leper Scholar, as it is written, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. That, of course, is from Isaiah 53. And that quote is from uh, Sanhedrin 98, small case B. Similarly, in an explanation of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 14, in the Midrash, Rabbah, it states, He is speaking of the King Messiah. Come hither, draw near to the throne, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. This refers to the chastisements, as it is said, that he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Again, from Isaiah 53, the Zohar, in its interpretation of Isaiah 53, points to the Messiah as well. There is, in the Garden of Eden, a palace named the Palace of the Sons of Sickness. This palace, the Messiah enters, and he summons every pain and every chastisement of Israel. All of these come and rest upon him. And had he not thus lightened them upon himself, there had been no man able to bear Israel's chastisements for the transgression of the law. As it is written, surely our sicknesses he has carried. That's from Zohar, Roman 2, 2.12, small case A. Rabbis today who believe Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people have been left to their own analysis for this interpretation. It's not in the Talmud. And there are different opinions on how the Jewish people fulfill the verses of Isaiah 53. Rabbi Tovia Singer of Outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism both believe Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as Israel. And they disagree with each other in their analysis. This is not unusual. Rabbi Nachmanides, Nachmanides often disagree with Rabbi Nanamides, Rambam. Toby Fink Singer follows the Christian belief that God sacrifices his children. By applying the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah, Leviticus, to human beings. And Jews for Judaism believes in an exaltation, the Messianic heir, so to speak, of the Jewish people, following the teachings of the sages and rabbis on an era of redemption, restoration, and exaltation of the Jewish people. The opinions and disagreements on the interpretation of Isaiah 53 are not a case of interpreting a vague law of God given to Moses, whose meaning must be determined in the oral tradition to be properly observed. Those who believe Israel is described and is God's righteous servant do not understand the importance of having a description of a man prophesied to come. These men, this man does not work miracles. There has to be a description of it for the day of the Lord. God, God is coming with a new covenant. So there's an angel being sent with it too. And so is his messenger to clear the way for him. Okay, and to do other things, which is Elijah. 
a man who could do the things Elijah could do and had the knowledge Elijah would have. He is not the Elijah of the, of the biblical Bible. He was not taken to heaven alive. If you leave this earth and go and are pulled up to the platform of heaven, your body has died. That's why they looked for it for three days, couldn't find it. But nobody, he's gone, he's dead. The shortest verse in the Christian New Testament is Jesus wept. That's it. <laughs> There's one verse, Jesus wept. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And still the people did not believe he was who he said he was. There is no description of him. There's none of Jesus. He didn't have a description, so he stole one. He said, I'm the man described in Isaiah 53. That's not even, that's not possible. He's not a man of suffering, familiar with disease. God didn't choose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. He did not make the many righteous with long life and by his knowledge. He didn't have children. He wasn't exposed to death. He died. He wasn't shunned and despised. He wasn't accounted plagued, smitten of God and afflicted. He didn't match any of the verses except one. He lied. He is a sinner. You can call him the unblemished lamb of God, but being called and said to be sinless is not the same as being sinless when the scripture reveals otherwise. In Judaism, does not seem to realize how important a description is. Jesus did. He knew he didn't match. If he's as smart as everybody says he was, if he's teaching at synagogue when he's 12 years old, if he's the son of God, he knows. He knows he's not the man of Isaiah 53. Or at least, if he's not that smart, he did find out on the cross he was wrong. Because he thought he was going to be given long life. He thought he was going to be exposed to death. Because he believed he was that man. And so what does he say on the cross when he sees he's going to die? Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus saying I'm not the man of Isaiah 53. So... Jews for Judaism and Outreach Judaism, they don't realize how important the description of God's servant David is for the building of the third temple. Not, not to mention avoidance of utter destruction to the land of Israel and the seven million Israeli Jews that live there. Of course, I know y'all don't live there or you didn't in past years for quite a while. Rambam says that King Moshiach Builds the third temple, we will know he is Moshe. People better know who he is long before that. It is. If Elijah is not recognized, his purpose in clearing the way for the Lord, Lord's return to his temple will not prosper. And God will bring utter destruction to the land. Now, it's possible you might be able to interpret that the land to be the world but I'm pretty sure it's Jesus, he's just talking to Israel there are about seven okay I just covered that There are many unknowns in the teachings of the sages and rabbis of the ancient age. And God's righteous servant makes the many righteous by his knowledge and long life. Their teaching was he's the leper scholar. A single man. A messiah. Which means anointed one. Which comes from, which comes from uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah.
There is only a description of this one man to come, and no man to this day has ever fulfilled all the verses of Isaiah 53. Not the man called the teacher of righteousness of the Dead Sea Scrolls, who founded the sect of Judaism called Essenes 100 years before the birth of Jesus. Not Jesus, who claimed he was the man of Isaiah 53. And not any of the men who had been thought to be Hamoshiach, the anointed one. From the Jewish revolt against Rome, such as Bar Kokhba, to Rabbi Menachem Mendel Shirson, known as the Lubavitcher, who died in 1994. But let's look at, there are references in Isaiah 53, I think it's verse 2, of a trunk that has grown out of arid uh, ground, and uh, a reference to the righteous servant being uh, raised, raised to great heights, like a, uh, a crown of a great tree. But that starts in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. The Spirit of God alights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. It's a stump because the ancestral tree of Jesse, who is the father of King David, has been cut down. God banished the line of the kings of Judah when Babylon destroyed the temple and deported them to uh, Babylon. The last king, Jeconia, he just told him. No, no, no descendant of yours will ever rule on the throne of David, <clears throat> from the throne of David over Judah again. And that's what the stump is. A shoot grows out of it. That's, that's a different line of descendants. We don't know anything about it. David had many, many children. And from that particular branch or shoot, you find a twig on a tree, a new ancestral tree that nobody has any idea of. No man can prove who he is by saying, here's my ancestry back to King David. And the proof of it is not there. I mean, that's just common sense. you got to have a description of it. I mean, God continues using ancestral tree uh, metaphors in Isaiah 53. This is prophetic. Isaiah prophetically refers to the stump of Jesse, father of King David, as an announcement of the ending of the line of the kings of Judah. Now he's right, Isaiah's writing this. God's having him write it. But he's writing this long before Jeconia was banished by God in Jerusalem and the temple destroyed. Whose last king, Jeconia, was banished and the line terminated. The line of the kings of Judah is the ancestral tree of David, forbidden, forbidden to ever rule in Judah and Jerusalem. The tree fell, leaving a stump. It is the line of heirs in the first chapter of the book of the New Testament of Christianity of the Holy Bible. We start out with the banished ancestral tree in the Christian Holy Bible. The New Testament. That's where we start. You got to go past the book they stole and call their own. And then give it no meaning and call it an Old Testament. Let's just delete it and take it out. It's got no business with the New Testament. And who is that line? Why do we start there? It's the line of Jesus Christ. The kings, the line, God no longer wanted. That's where it starts. God did not banish this line of Jesse of the kings of Judah until long after the death of Isaiah. God knew in Isaiah's time that the line of the kings of Judah would be taken into exile and his temple destroyed. That he would end that line, leaving just the stump of Jesse for his anointed one to be raised from. Jesse... Jesus could not fulfill the book of Isaiah 
Not for the reason that his line had been banished, but simply because he doesn't come from the stone. I mean, Christians can say, oh, well, that line was banished, but he sent Jesus anyway, so he must have lent, he must have lifted the banishment. Yeah, but he's still not from the stump. And he's certainly not describing Isaiah 53. You need to take your scissors and cut your Old Testament out. Your Old Testament doesn't belong with the New Testament. There is no Jesus in it. He didn't do anything in it except he took some parts that the Jews expected, like a conqueror, a savior. Well, they're under, they're, they're all under rule of Rome. Jesus takes one prophecy and says, all the prophets say of me, using your Old Testament Christians, all the prophets say of me, I shall ride this ass into Jerusalem. And the next, well, the prophecy he's quoting, the next verse is verse 10. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And he says, and there the Gentiles will scourge me, spit on me, spate me, uh, and kill me. But on the third day I shall rise. All the prophets, Jesus, well, let me see, I got 20 right here. Right, Christians, you've got 20. Open them up. Open them up and see if he's telling the truth. Now, back when Christianity got started, nobody could do that. That's why it got rolling in such a ridiculous concept. God made a human sacrifice to you, the Son, so you don't have to obey His laws. And He left the Jews because they sinned too much. Well, why, why did you have to have somebody uh, sacrifice for you to be free and righteous and free of your sins? You weren't sinless when God said, I can't take the Jews anymore? Oh, I think you weren't. Yeah, I don't think so. And guess what? No Jesus ever died for your sin. There's not a Gentile out there that's not responsible for his sins and will not be in righteousness and will not be in right standing. And there's no way you ever are going to go to the Jewish heaven. God says, I'm making a heaven where the name Israel shall endure. If you want to see heaven, if you want to find forgiveness, if you want to fall under the written, <clears throat> written forgiveness God brings with him in the day of the Lord, which is today, according to Jeremiah 31, then you're going to have to convert to Judaism. You're going to have to become a Jew. And guess what? God would say back at you. You go to my people and try to force them to convert to Christianity, a pagan sect of human sacrifice? Back at you. And you know why he says that? Because he tells his people in chapter 51 of Isaiah, which leads into the description of the righteous servant in 52 and 53. I'm taking my <clears throat> cup of wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, and I'm passing it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. They would be you Christians. You took the book. You told them they don't know how to read it. You told them they, it's prophetic of Jesus Christ, a false idol, a false god. You told them that he's the man in Isaiah 53. And so this is what happens. That, that's chapter 11. Talking about the uh, symbolism of an ancestral tree. For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown. Like a tree trunk out of arid ground. That's Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2. This continues the symbolism of the ancestral tree. This man grows by the favor of God like a tree crown. A dominant tree crown reaches over all other plants in the forest. Including the crowns of other trees. From a sinful man whose life has been full of pain, suffering, <laughs> sorrows and familiar with disease that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, alights upon and God's presence is in him to the crown of God's righteous servant. There are other verses of Isaiah 11 that connect the anointed one 
to the man described in Isaiah 53. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nations shall seek his counsel and his abode shall be honored. That's Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10. By oppressive judgment he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. That's Isaiah 53, 8. And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no injustice and had spoken no falsehood. That's Isaiah 53, 9. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. That's Isaiah 53, 12. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living. In Isaiah 53, the world of material things in society. That's in Isaiah 53, 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion and the multitude as his spoil and an abode to the honor. Those are just simple ways God had connected chapter 11. The me but the sages got it. God's not going to say he's sending a man and not describe him for us. we got to know how to locate him. But as I said, those who say Israel's described the Jewish people and how did the right? What have they done as the righteous servant? When does it happen? Yeah, you know, Jews for Judaism would say, "Oh, when the Messianic here is when David gets here." Oh, really? Well, what are you going to be doing since when David comes, God has a reckoning with the rabbis and dismisses you. And just so you know, I am the man described in Isaiah fifty-three. God is here. I am the descendant of David, and you, Rabbi, are dismissed in the eyes of God, who has me tell you this, this very morning. Thank you.